and welcome to Culture on I-24 News. I'm Ugan Grober. Thank you so much for joining me today on our program. We'll talk about political cartoons in times of war. Restoration work in Rome is foiling some visitors' experiences. And an upcoming film about the godfather of soul. But first, some of today's cultural headlines. We start with The Property, a graphic novel by Israeli artist Rutu Modan, which has won the Eisner Award, the most prestigious in the world of comics. The book won in the category of Best New Graphic Album in a ceremony at the San Diego Comic-Con this weekend. This is Rutu Modan's second Eisner win after her 2007 book Exit Wounds. The property tells the story of a woman and her grandmother who traveled to Poland in search of lost property that belonged to the family before the Second World War, forcing the women to confront the past. The book previously received the special jury prize at the Angoulême Festival. Modan told the Washington Post, the last month in Israel is so depressing and stressful. It was wonderful to have at last a reason to be happy. I hope we will have a chance in this messy area where I happen to live and raise my children to overcome our fears and violence and make peace with our neighbors and between ourselves. Amen to that. Moving on, uh, Spanish actor Javier Bardem penned an open letter condemning Israel's actions in Gaza. A hundred Spanish celebrities, including Pedro Almodovar, Penelope Cruz, Benito Zambrano, and Eduardo Noriega, signed the letter calling Israel's actions genocide and state terrorism. Going on to say, Gaza is living through horror these days, besieged and attacked by land, sea, and air. Palestinians' homes are being destroyed. The letter also calls for uh, the European Union to condemn Israel's actions. European Jewish Congress President Moshe Kanto responded that the assertion that Israel is perpetrating genocide is not only patently false and detached from reality, but also inflammatory and outrageous. Political cartoons are a staple of press commentary, venting frustrations and fears. This is especially true in times of combat. Very happy to have Asaf Gamzu, the curator of the Israeli Cartoon Museum, in the studio to tell us about political cartoons in times of strife and what's being published in Israeli newspapers today. Thanks for coming in, Asaf. Thank you. So um, let's, uh, first in general, what, what role do political cartoons play in our lives? Well, as you said, political cartoons are really a staple of, of the press and in, and in any democracy, and of course in times of war. Uh, press is important. Press mm -hmm. is the watchdog of democracy, of being able to perhaps say something different. And, you know, in the States, um, Pulitzer Prizes are given to editorial cartooning, meaning it's seen as important as any other form of the press. It is as important, but it, it's also, it's, it's a little different than, than op-eds or, or, or just any, any old uh, um, newspaper writing. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, well, if we say that a picture is worth a, a thousand words, and I would imagine a cartoonist would like to be worth, I don't know, three op-eds, something, <laughs> something like that. Um, well, cartoonists want to make us laugh, mm -hmm. and political cartoonists want to make us laugh about our lives, which is trickier. And you know, finding something which is absurd in our in our daily lives is rather easy. Making us laugh about it, while recognizing the sadness inherent in the situation, is trickier. More, yeah, and especially so in, in times, times like this, in times of combat. Yeah, no doubt. Um, what's interesting is to try and see whether really, you know, there's the famous phrase that when uh, uh, when the guns are blazing, then, mm -hmm. you know... The muses are silent. Be, exactly. And it's interesting to see whether that is true in the case of cartooning, because if you really do believe that uh, political cartoons are important in, in democracy, it means they're very important in times of war, and it means that they need to keep on doing supposedly what they did in peace times, meaning uh, pointing the finger at absurdities in our political system, in our daily lives, mm -hmm. and I think to an extent they actually do. So the, you, you think they do? I mean, are there areas that, that Israeli cartoonists are, are not comfortable going to, uh, and you know, especially at times like this when the people are sort of united around yeah. the uh, well, sun goal? 
I think that uh, that in Israel, I I have yet to see a cartoon, especially now, that will uh, criticize the culture of, as we say in Hebrew, shchol, of the mourning over fallen uh, fallen soldiers. And I think now it's it's definitely a taboo, especially when it's so fresh. It, mm-hmm. it's, it's happening right now around us, and I don't think anyone uh, anyone will touch will touch that. That is a lot to ask for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah and certainly. I think that's also okay. You know, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I know. Um, you brought us some some examples yeah. of, of what's uh, happening in the in, in newspapers in Israel today. Let's take a look. All right. So this is from really just the start. We can see a guy Murad drawing for Idiot Achronot. Kids are coming out of the school for their summer vacation and straight into the bunkers because of the. Tseva Adom, Yutzim Lechofesh is it's in a red color. Sound, right? Exactly, and it's like Tseva Adom, the sound of the alarm, red, red color, so they're going straight to the bunkers. Yeah. And still. On with, the other side of the border. Exactly. Two weeks afterwards, the same newspaper, the same cartoonist, Guy Murad, is drawing uh, the Hamas version of the summer vacation with kids crying, I want to go to mommy, and a Hamas terrorist saying, no one's going anywhere because they're using kids as. Yeah, uh, it's uh, the, the, the Kassam summer camp. Exactly. Yeah, let's keep going. Uh, here we have one from today, Biderman uh, from Haaretz, uncharacteristically, actually uh, pro-Bibi somewhat. We can see Bibi as a soldier trying to block a tunnel with terrorists coming out, and Barack Obama telling him, stop this immediately, actually legitimizing uh, Bibi's action and Barack... Yeah, seeing that in Haaretz is uh, yeah, pretty, ra- pretty rare, I have to say. This is from yeah. a couple of days ago. Perez is retiring from the from the presidency, and you know, as any retired gentleman, he goes to the park <laughs> the feed to feed the, the pigeons, pigeons, and he sees a familiar there. face. <laughs> exactly <laughs> the the Yonata Shalom, the, the the dove of peace, the peace dove. I'm sorry, the peace dove. You say, are you familiar? Do I know you from somewhere? <laughs> Uh, and this is uh, this is uh, the shadow. Had That's said. a good one. That's yeah. a little bit of internal issues because uh, uh, this is actually this character is a mixture of Lieberman mm-hmm. uh, and and the shadow uh, uh, known um, the rapper, a the rapper, rapper, rapper that came to symbolize the the far uh, right yeah, and these the brutality days. of the yeah. far right in the in the demonstrations. So this is as you said, this is inter-Israeli. We see the shadow Atzel, which is the name of the rapper, but Bibi's shadow is. Lieberman, the foreign, the foreign affairs minister, who turns out to be this like uh, thug inside mm-hmm. the, the government, mm-hmm. and this is us, you know, seeing an example of criticizing the government in times of war. Yeah. So this is one, another one from Biederman from yesterday. We see the the cease, uh, the the termination of the humanitarian ceasefire. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, we think of the ceasefire between Hamas and IDF, but this is between. The left wing and right wing protesters going back to their war again. We see a representation of Atzel, of yeah. the rapper, and all of these bespectacled uh, left wing <laughs> intellectuals saying peace, peace now, now, peace now. Yeah, that uh, that that humanitarian ceasefire has collapsed. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, and here we see uh, uh, when a week ago the plane stopped uh, going in and out of Israel. So we see Israeli families trying to go hitchhike a ride with Elal to Paris, uh, to Paris. To Turkey, Rome, or to uh, to Disney, to Euro, Euro Disney, Disney yeah. in Paris. Uh, yeah, it uh, it serves its role, and uh, uh, the peace of another uh, makes another appearance. Exactly, the peace of, and again the cancelled flight. So the peace of has nowhere to go. I think that speaks for itself. It does, no doubt. Uh, Asaf, uh, thank you so much for this. Thank you it's for been, having uh, me. Uh, interesting and entertaining as uh, cartoons should be. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rome is one of the world's most uh, foremost tourist destinations. However, visitors this season were troubled to find many of the city's attractions closed or obscured for renovations. Samuel Calvo has more in this report. The city of Rome is one of the most popular tourist destinations in Europe. But at the height of summer, the heart of tourist season, many of the famous attractions are undergoing restoration. Thousands of tourists from around the world who are discovering Rome are left disappointed. We are very frustrated because nobody informed us that the main monuments are closed. We have come far, from 10,000 kilometers away. We really want to visit, but we can't. The restoration work is nonetheless an absolute necessity if the Italian capital hopes to retain the title of the eternal city. 
the Trevi Fountain is cloaked in grey scaffolding, which make it difficult to see the splendor of this monument made famous by Federico Fellini in La Dolce Vita. A few meters away are the Spanish steps, with the Fontana de la Barcaccia and Trinita di Monti's church perched at the end of the monumental staircase again made new. The surprising choice of timing to perform such important work is based on the absence of groups of school children on the one hand and on the other hand of older people who are deterred by the rising temperatures. Outdoor working conditions are also easier at this time of year on workers who are restoring sites without fear of torrential rains of the autumn and spring. The foot of the Colosseum is wrapped with a metal structure in order to refresh the facade, but tourists continue to arrive undeterred. Fortunately, some visitors still find charm in the city despite the ongoing work. We didn't realize that there were renovations all around the place. We discovered them as we went along, but it doesn't matter. Rome is still magical, so it's okay. Now, James Brown, often referred to as the godfather of soul, is finally getting his own biopic. Uh, Daniel Campos is here in the studio to tell us all about it. How are you, Daniel? Hello, Dad. Yeah, great news. D uh, James, yeah, I think he deserves it. It's been uh, eight years since he passed away in 2006, and uh, now comes the time uh, for him to be honored. And Mick Jagger is one of the producers of this uh, film. That's already a great honor, I think, to have Mick Jagger produce a film. Mick Jagger, is he a producer? Has he ever produced any film? Uh, not that I know of, uh, but in this case, it has to do, they were very close friends. Mm. Even Mick Jagger said that a lot of the dance moves uh, he performs on stage were actually copied from James <laughs> Brown. And, uh, well, this friendship ended in 2006. But again, uh, he's taken part in this uh, great uh, film, t you know, to yeah. honor James Brown. Now uh, there's a trailer out. So why don't we uh, watch a, a moment of it and come back? One, two, three, you know who it is? What's wrong, Mazel? You can't play that like you told us. It doesn't work musically. It doesn't sound good. Yeah. Get up, does it feel good? Yeah, yeah. Get up, if it sounds good and it feels good, then it's musical. You're entering a game here where the rules are already set out. I'm just a street kid from Augusta, Georgia. Now, tell me what you see. Get over there. Get out back. Get President, get over I want to go to Vietnam. My baby playing at the Apollo. Hey, your baby. I did not know. I feel good. I already love it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what is it about James Brown that, that makes it makes him and his music so lovable. Uh, well, I would say for this film is uh, the portrait of his life, a very difficult life. He was orphaned. Uh, we can say at a young age, his mother abandoned him. She then showed up later on when he was already successful. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to his music, he was very much inspired by gospel, by music from church. He would uh, sit out of church and uh, listen and feel the groove. He was not afraid to take risks. Uh, his entire career, the dance moves, as I said, the energy. Uh, there's a quote by him which I really enjoy, and he said, I have outdone anyone, Mozart, Beethoven, <laughs> Bach, Strauss, and Irving, Irving Berlin. He says, I wrote 5,500 songs. That's yeah. James Brown. Very energetic, always wanted to do more. And very modest, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, he definitely earned his, his, uh, his place uh, among the greats. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's just me, but it feels like there's Oscar written all over it, maybe because of, uh, of what we've learned from Ray when Jamie Foxx uh, got an Oscar for, for uh, portraying Ray Charles and uh, later uh, Walk the Line. Walk uh, the Line, absolutely. It's definitely similar. Uh, it, all, it also takes place in, in the south of the right. United States. Uh, poverty-stricken neighborhoods and uh, people overcoming challenges uh, and becoming successful musicians. So I definitely think uh, we, uh, it will be out in August. Uh, it always works wonderfully, you know, these, these films with the great, great music that we've all, we all grew up with and, and love so much. And uh, if, if they don't mess it up, like, let's say, Dreamgirls or something like that, that it turns out Too much cheese, good. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's something, again, uh, when James Brown passed away his funeral in 2006, the casket opened and people performing music on stage just tells you what a magnificent man James Brown was. Uh, right. Absolutely incredible. Now, this actor that, that was chosen to, to portray him, uh, not a very well-known. Uh, Chadwick Boseman, yeah, definitely not that famous, but 
uh, I mean, uh, from what you can see in the trailer, he's definitely bringing in that energy. Yeah. Uh, and they, in the past, he did, I think, play a, a baseball legend, uh, Jackie Robinson, in, in the film 42, which he, he did a pretty uh, decent job. Uh, he can pull it off, it seems. Also a role, uh, again, these roles also bring in the racial elements, the tensions of the 1960s uh, when African Americans were yet not accepted into society, and these people overcame these boundaries. Right. All right. Uh, thank you, Daniel, so much. Thank you, Odette. Thank you at home for uh, joining us as well. We'll be back tomorrow with a whole new edition of Culture. Till then, we leave you today with this gag reel from the set of Game of Thrones, shown at uh, this year's San Diego Comic-Con. Enjoy. You don't partake? Oh, I part up now I'm married. Prince Oberyn, if I may, a word in private. <laughs> <laughs> but now that I am a magic... <laughs>